do you have something doubts or not i don't know not for now i guess okay so then what we'll do is we'll do polynomials today uh this is an algebra topic which you are probably familiar with but we'll do a little bit of extension and problems which will help you for the exam uh next week we'll do coordinate geometry we'll do curves which is conic sections and all of the curves that you have to learn right so yes this week we'll do polynomials next week we'll do coordinate so let's get started so you know the definition of a polynomial right yeah. definition is basically it's a collection of terms like it has a set of terms it looks like this f of x is equal to a n x bar n plus a n minus 1 x bar n minus 1 and so on till a 1 x plus a not here a n a n minus 1 and all of these terms a1 a0 are constants are real numbers right and oh, yeah. and the powers of x powers of x have to be natural numbers or integers not negative integers so powers of x have to be natural numbers you can say and it could be zero also right yes you cannot have a fractional power <clears throat> if you have some root 2 x plus root x this is not a polynomial because here power of x here is half right however root yeah. 2 x square plus x plus 2 this is a polynomial because powers are either 2 1 or 0 and these could be any numbers the coefficients these are called the coefficients right these oh, co yes. coefficients could be any real numbers powers however have to be natural numbers or it could be zero and each of these terms is a monomial and a collection of such terms is a polynomial right now this term the first term is called leading term leading term of the polynomial and the the power of x the power of x in leading term is called the degree of the polynomial basically leading term is whatever is the highest power of x right yeah <coughs> that that highest power of x is known as the degree of the polynomial so if you have a degree of 1 then that is a linear polynomial here you have a degree of 2 because i s power is 2 that is a quadratic polynomial sometimes you have cubic polynomials with degree 3 and so on right yeah and uh, if the leading term the leading coefficient leading coefficient means coefficient of the leading term which is your an if that is equal to 1 if an is equal to 1 then that polynomial is called a monic polynomial if your first coefficient the leading term's coefficient is 1 it is a monic polynomial okay now you understand all these things no you probably already know this right yeah i do okay so you can say that you have remainder and factor theorem here factor theorem says that if x plus a is a factor of f of x which is a polynomial this is a polynomial then f of a must be zero then f of a is equal to zero right okay i mean x minus a i made a mistake if you put x plus a then you have to put f of minus a is equal to zero so you should say x minus a is a factor then f then f of a is equal to zero so you can check this very easily for example x square minus 2x plus 1 is my polynomial 
then you can say that f of one is clearly zero here. Therefore, x minus one is a factor, right? Yeah. Because it actually it is x minus one whole into x minus one, right? Yeah. So all the zeros, all the zeros of a polynomial are basically numbers such that they will make f of z equal to zero. Then z is a zero or root of the polynomial. Correct? Yeah. And if any time something is a root of a polynomial, then x minus z will be a factor. Okay. Right? From factor theorem. Correct? Makes sense, no? Yeah. Okay. Then some basic rules. If you have two polynomials, fx and gx, fx has degree of m and gx has degree of n, then what is the degree of fx plus minus gx? What do you think is the degree of that? Um, it would be m plus n. No, think, think. Oh, it would be the virtue of whichever one is larger. Uh, so maximum of M and N and it is less than equal to that. Why am I putting a less than equal to sign? Because sometimes what you could have is you could have cancellation of the highest power term, right? Oh you yeah. Okay. This polynomial like this and this polynomial like this, right? Yeah. And when you add them, you get a polynomial which is only x square, right? Mm. Right? Because so the negative one can also, uh, a negative one, negative numbers can also be coefficients. Yeah. So you can have cancellations. So it, it might be possible that fx plus gx has degree two instead of three. Right? Yeah. So mm. the degree of fx plus minus gx, degree of fx plus minus gx will always be less than equal to the maximum degree of either of them, maximum of M or N, right? Correct? Yeah. yeah. Second one is if Fx multiplied by Gx you do, then what should be the degree now? I think in this case, it might be M plus N. Yeah, because highest power maximum will multiply. Maximum at least, less so than. It, it will be M plus N. Oh. Because highest powers will multiply, no? Yeah. So x power m plus 1, and there will be x power n minus 2x plus 1. The highest power will be the term that comes with multiplication here, right? Yeah. If you have a constant number, you can even say fx is equal to 5. This is a polynomial also, even though it has no x, but you will say degree is 0 here, right? Yeah. Degree of this polynomial is zero or yeah, zero. Uh, then the third one is, let's say you have two polynomials fx and gx and you find out f of g of x. Do you understand what this means? This is called composition of two functions. Composition of two functions. Have you seen this before? Yeah. So for example, if fx is equal to x plus one and gx is equal to x squared, right? Yeah. Then f of g of x, basically in the fx function, I'm giving input of g of x, right? It's equal to x squared plus one. So it is f of x squared, which is equal to x squared plus one. And notice that g of f of x will be different, okay? It will be g of x plus one, which will be? It'll be x squared plus two x plus one. Oh, so it will be this, right? Yeah. So f of g of x is not necessarily equal to g of f of x. But what you see here is that f of g of x has a polynomial of degree two, right? 
and this has a polynomial of degree two two. And this was one and two, right? Degrees were one and two, right? Yeah. So the degree of this is equal to m into n. Okay. Okay. The only condition is that one of them should not be a constant polynomial. If you have a constant polynomial, then the degree remains m only. Right? Okay. You understand? Constant polynomial means like a degree of zero, right? Ah, but uh, actually, constant polynomial degree is not defined as zero. Constant polynomial because see, if you put degree zero, then it will become zero, right? Huh. But the product of a normal polynomial and a constant polynomial will have degree equal to whatever it was, right? So yeah. Technically, you cannot define constant polynomial having degree zero. You should, because sometimes it will fail, right? This will fail then, right? Hmm. Uh, you can say that degree of a constant polynomial is minus infinity, but uh, that, I mean, it's difficult to talk about it right now. This is slightly higher level stuff. So don't worry about it. Just know that constant polynomial will be some exception cases, right? Okay. So for example, in this formula that m into n comes, the constant form polynomial degree will not work, right? Yeah. However, you can check any other type of polynomial as long as it is not constant. Suppose fx is equal to x plus one and gx is equal to x cube, right? You will get yeah. that f of g of x will have degree of three, right? Yeah. And if it was x squared plus one, then you should have degree of six. Right, so it will be f of x cube, and notice that it will be f of x cube, which will be x cube whole square plus one. Right, it will be x six plus one. Right, correct. Yeah. So the degree is multiplied if you have composition of two functions. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Now. The next thing we'll look at is the, there is a, just like in numbers, we have uh, some, some number is divided by another number. Then you have this uh, division lemma, right? A is equal to B Q plus R, right? When, yes. When A, when B divides A, this is what happens, right? So uh, what we can say is Q was the quotient and R was the remainder, right? Correct. Yeah. And remainder must be smaller than B, right? If, yeah. rem if remainder, actually it will be exactly so not equal to also. If remainder is smaller than B, then only it is a remainder. Otherwise you would have done Q plus one, right? Yes. So similarly, uh, you can divide two polynomials also, FX and GX. So you have to ensure that degree of this is M and degree of this is N and M is greater than N, right? Yes. Then when you divide, you will get something like this. Fx is equal to Qx, which is the quotient into Gx plus Rx, right? Yeah, which is the remainder. Uh, this is a quotient polynomial and this is the remainder polynomial. So remainder polynomials degree should be smaller than the degree of the Gx, right? Yeah. Degree of R is less than degree of G. Otherwise, you would have completely divided once more, right? It's G. Um, yeah. Right? You would have gotten something else than Q dash X, right? Correct? Correct. So now uh, there is remainder theorem also, which says that if your FX is divided by, is divided by some factor like X minus A, then remainder will be F of A. Remainder is f of a. This is the same thing as factor theorem because if remainder f of a was zero, then you would say that it completely divides because the remainder is zero, right? Okay. And then yeah. it would have become a factor, right? Correct? Yes. So, so you can actually say that f of x is equal to, let's say we divide by x minus a. So x minus a into quotient x plus r of x, right? Yeah. So f, if you put a in it, you'll get f of a is equal to a minus a q of a plus r of a. So remainder's value is equal to f of a, right? Yeah. This is the proof of the remainder theorem, right? Because I'm dividing fx and qx, two polynomials, and I'm getting remainder is equal to 
when i divide by x minus a no actually the q was a quotient i'm dividing fx by x minus a right yeah i am getting something so that something will be f of a is equal to r of a right that something is coming out as f of a right that is the yeah. remainder right yeah mm -hmm. so we will see a few questions which are using the ideas that we have seen so far so for example one question is what is the remainder find the remainder find the remainder then x plus x power 9 plus x power 25 plus x power 49 plus x power 81 is divided is divided by x cube minus x okay so in questions like this there is one approach where you just do brute force division right long division you know that no yeah polynomial long division uh, polynomial long division you can always do but if the question is very big then maybe it is better to simplify a little bit and try to factorize and see right this is obviously going to give the answer and notice yes that the remainder has to be either degree 2 or degree 1 or degree 0 right? or or constant right yeah it cannot be having higher degree than 2 right correct okay so um okay you try it for 2 3 minutes if you get it great then otherwise i will tell you what to do okay Well, um, one thing we could do is that we could start. We could factor sec um x to the third power minus x first. Now we can try and factor. So you can take x common and becomes x power eighty plus x power forty eight plus x power twenty four plus plus one and try to get out x square minus one from here, right? 
Yeah. If we can factor it, then it will be fine. Then we might get some remainder and all. Hey, but we can use remainder theorem for this, right? Hmm? Oh. Because the um divisor is has factors of x, x minus one, and x minus one. Hmm. So then if we put like f let's say f like y f1 f1 hmm. will be equal to rx correct but the problem is that this one has multiple factors right oh, okay like only one of them will not give you the answer no yeah so like you don't know how to combine <clears throat> when three factors are there right yeah so that is the problem so so first try to, if you can try to get x square minus one from here, no, if you can. Like one thing you should know is x power n minus one by x minus one, right? Is equal mm -hmm. to x power n minus one plus x power n minus two plus so on, so on till one. This is a standard identity. Like you can check this by putting n is equal to four or n is equal to three, right? If you put four here, here, you should get x cubed plus x square plus x plus one. And you can check by multiplying this and this, right? Whether it works or not. Yeah. Similarly, if you put x cubed minus one, x minus one in this formula, you'll get x square plus x plus one, which is true. See, x minus one into this is equal to this, right? A cube minus b cube. Yeah. So this formula you should write down. This is very important. Uh, this is a division. You can check it by division also. This will come. So here, since this part is x into x square minus one, we have to, mm -hmm. we have already taken out an x, right? Yeah. So we have to try to see whether x square minus one can be taken out from here, right? Yeah. Okay. So you can prove that x power 80 minus 1, x power 48 minus 1, x power 24 minus 1, x power 8 minus 1, all of these are divisible by x square minus 1. Why? Because if you take x square as t, you can say that this is t power 40 minus 1 by t minus 1. No? Yeah. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes. So all of these are divisible by x square minus one. Therefore, let's just make this like that, right? Like if I add a minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, then I have to add a plus four, right? Yes. So this will become, total will become x power 80 minus one plus x power 48 minus one and so on, so on, plus five, right? Yes. And in each of these, there is a factor of x square minus one, right? Correct. So that factor, so you can write the whole thing as x into x square minus one into whatever factors come plus five x, no? X into yeah. five, right? You cannot take x square minus one from five, right? Yeah. So this whole part is clearly divisible by x into x square minus one, right? Yes. So five x is the remainder. Okay. Right. Yeah. Another way to do this. Another way to do this would be uh, this. Suppose you have x power 81 plus x power 49 plus x power 25 plus x power 9 plus x, right? We can say that we yeah. have... Divide it by divide by x cube minus x, right? So let's use the division lemma, which says this polynomial should be equal to some quotient into x cube minus x plus some remainder, right? Yeah. Right. And we know that the remainder has to be of degree two or less, right? Okay. Less than or equal to degree two, no? Yeah. Because my divisor is degree three. Correct? Yeah. So if you take the remainder as some 
quadratic polynomial, it will be in general this, right? Ax squared plus bx plus c, right? Yes. We can take this because if a is equal to zero, it becomes degree one, right? If b is equal to zero, it becomes constant. Both are zero, right? Yeah. So for different different values of a, b, and c, you can cover all the cases, whether it is degree two or degree one or constant, right? Yeah. <coughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So this thing is equal to qx into x cube minus x plus ax square plus bx plus c, right? Yeah. And now it is very easy because I know the factors of this, right? I know the yeah. factors of this are 0, 1, and minus 1, right? Yes. So I will put the exact, those values I will put, right? So that this part disappears and we'll see what comes here and we'll see what comes here, right? Yeah. So if I put 0, for example, here we'll get 0, right? 0 is equal to this part will be 0 plus ax square will be 0 plus 0 plus c, right? Yes. Immediately you get c is equal to 0, right? Yeah. If you put 1, what happens? C 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, 5. 5 is equal to this part is 0. And you get 5 is equal to a plus b because c is anyway 0 now, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. if you put minus 1, what happens? This is negative, this is negative, this is negative, this is negative. So minus 4 plus minus minus 5, right? That minus 5 is equal to yeah. a minus b. Right? Yeah. So add these two and you'll get zero is equal to two A. So A is equal to zero. Therefore B must be five, right? Um, yeah. So the Rx is equal to five X now. Correct. Yes. So basically the idea was use your division algorithm to write this equation that polynomial to be divided is equal to QX into the factor plus Rx. And then in general, Rx will be a quadratic or a lower degree polynomial. So you can write it as ax squared plus bx plus c. And after that, you just put the factors of the x cube minus x there. And that will give you multiple equations from where you can find a, b, and c, right? Yeah. OK. OK, so another question. This is this one. Prove that the polynomial x power 9999 nine, nine, nine plus x power 8888 eight, 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 eight plus 7777 seven, 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 and so on till x power 1111 one, one, one plus 1, right, is divisible, is mm -hmm. divisible by x power 9 plus x power 8 plus x power 7 plus x plus 1. Okay. Yeah. So this we have to try to do.
now in this one our second method won't work so well because you know our remainder will be degree eight or less right yeah so many variables will be there no nine variables will be there in a degree eight polynomial right yeah we cannot do it like that so we have to think of something else now we have to try to factorize it somehow so let p be equal to this one and let q be this one right then we have to prove that q, p is divisible by q right so yeah okay so if p divides q no no if q divides p q divides p right then yeah q will also divide p minus q right yeah q will also divide p minus q correct yes so if we can show that p minus q is divisible by q that will mean that obviously p also has to be divisible by q right oh five yeah correct so yeah. We'll try to get P minus Q. And if you get P minus Q, you will write it as um, X power 9999 minus X power 9, right? Plus yeah. X power 8888 minus X power 8 plus 7777 minus 7, right? Minus X power 7 plus so on till x power 1, 1, 1, 1, minus x, and then minus 1, right? And there is yeah. a plus 1 and minus 1 which get cancelled, right? Yes. Right? So this part is not bothering us. So what we have is just this expression. P minus Q is this thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So from here, I can easily take x power 9 common here, x power 8 common here and stuff. So I'll get x power 9 common here. We'll get x nine 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 zero minus one, right? Yeah. Plus x power eight common here, x power eight 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 zero minus one, and so on. Plus x x common here, so it'll be one 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 zero minus one, right? Yeah. Correct. Yes. So, <clears throat> um, okay. Now. Notice that this is x power 9, x power 10 to the power 999 minus 1, right? Yeah. And this is x power 8, x power 8 to the power, no, x power 10 to the power 888 eight, eight minus 1, right? Yeah. And this is x power 10 to the power 111 one, one minus 1, right? Yeah. Now, uh, what this means is, what this means is, anytime you have x power 10, whole power n minus 1. Yeah. That will be divisible by x power 10, whole power n minus 1, will be divisible by x power 10 minus 1. Divisible by x power 10 minus 1. Why? Because we have already seen that x bar n minus 1 is divisible by x minus 1, right? Yeah. So instead of x, I'm just putting x bar 10, right? It is like z power n yeah. minus 1 minus by one. z minus 1, right? Yes. Correct. So what we know is each of these factors is divisible by x power 10 minus 1, no? Mm. Correct. Correct. So you can say that P minus Q is divisible by X power 10 minus one. Right? Yes. 
okay uh now what we have is this thing this thing is actually we have the factorization of x power 10 minus 1 by x minus 1 no that is actually this thing x power 9 yeah. x power 8 plus so on so on plus x plus 1 right so we know that x power 10 minus 1 is equal to product of x minus 1 and this thing right oh yes so p minus q is divisible by something which is a product of this is called q right we are getting p minus q is divisible by x minus 1 into q right yes so p minus q is clearly divisible by q right because it is divisible by x minus 1 into q yeah p minus q is divisible by q means p is divisible by q right yeah. you understand what is happening yeah so this divisibility problems this this, this is similar to problems that we will have in number theory when we do it okay so instead of x i could have put any number no it would still have worked yeah like if I put two power nine nine nine, it will be divisible by this big number, right? Yeah. So some very weird question can be framed here. Like you put x is equal to two, you'll get a very weird number, big number. And this side, you will not get such a big number. You'll get 512 plus 256 plus 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus eight plus four plus one plus two plus one, right? Yes. So which is actually equal to 2 part 10 minus 1. <coughs> this will be equal to 1, 0, 2, 3. So you can prove some weird things like this. Like uh, some big number is divisible by 1023. Right? Yes. So go through the steps once and make sure that you understand all of it. Uh, this is P. This is Q. And we are trying to say that Q should divide P, then that means if Q divides P, it should also divide P minus Q. And then we started simplifying P minus Q, right? Yeah. Uh, and P minus Q we got in such a way that we proved that X power 10 minus one definitely divides P minus Q, right? Yeah. And since X power 10 minus one is equal to X minus one into Q, therefore, Q divides P minus Q and Q oh, divides. Right. Q divides P minus Q, right? Hmm. So why, then why would um, P, I mean, Q divide P? Q divides P minus Q. Then it will have some quotient, right? Yes. Then Q will obviously divide P. No, you will add one Q to it. Obviously, you'll get one plus one in the quotient. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll have some quotient Q. But if you want to do P, you'll just P minus Q plus Q, right? Plus Q. Yeah. You'll get P. And that will be just Q plus one. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, we have proved this. You understood, no? So what we are using here constantly is this factorization x power n minus one by x minus one is equal to x power n minus one plus x power n minus two till x plus one. And we can generalize this also. We can say x power r power n minus one by x power r minus one will be equal to x power r n minus one plus x power r n minus two plus so on so on till x power r plus one. Instead of x, you can put a higher power of x also, right? Yes. So basically what we know is x minus one is a factor of x power n minus one and x power r minus one is a factor of x power n r minus one, right? Makes sense. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Then, then the next question will be 
now we are going to use different topics we are going to talk about factor theorem and all now so we have if f of x is a polynomial polynomial with integer coefficients with integer coefficients such that such that f of 1 and f of 2 are both odd right prove that prove that there is no integer n no integer n for which f of n is equal to 0 It's important to realize here that this is a polynomial with integer coefficients. Okay. Mm. You should try to prove by contradiction. It's because you're trying to prove that there is a remainder zero, maybe. So try to assume that there is an integer n such that f of n is zero, right? Yeah. There exists n such that. So if f of n is 0, then what is the factor of this fx? And x minus n is a factor. Hmm. x minus n is a factor of fx, right? Yeah. So then fx can be written as x minus n multiplied by another polynomial, right? Q, qx. Or gx, whatever, right? This Plus rx. No, no R, no. It's a factor. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. It's a factor, so there is no remainder, right? Yeah. This is fx is equal to x minus n gx, and gx, since n is an integer and fx has integer coefficients, gx also has integer coefficients, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, you have to use the fact that f1 and f2 are both odd, right? Correct? Yeah. So let's put one in this. Let's put F1, right? It will be equal to one minus N into G of one, right? Correct? Yeah. Let's put two. It should be two minus N into G of two. Correct? Yes. Okay. So what we are getting is this is odd and this is odd. Right. Yes. Uh, this is coming, right? Yeah. These are both odd, right? So now 
think about it two numbers are multiplied and you get an odd right so both have to be odd right oh yes this into this both have to be odd no for this to be odd right yeah so getting 1 minus n is odd right yes and getting 2 minus n is also odd right yeah but that is impossible no? why because this is just plus 1 right yeah so you can't have both of n and n is constant mm. so you can't have them both um n can't be odd and even two consecutive these are consecutive integers no yeah consecutive integers cannot be both odd yeah can't both be odd right Yes. So therefore there is a clear contradiction here i don't even care about this gx what is the odd even nature because i know that product of two integers is odd so both integers have to be odd right yeah so you are getting 1 minus n is odd 2 minus n is odd but these are consecutive integers so both cannot be odd right yeah thus n is not thus there is no such n for which f of n is zero right yeah <coughs> okay, just give me a minute to write it down please mm. yes. Okay, I'm done. So the next question is also very similar to what we just did, but slightly more advanced. If f f is a polynomial with integer coefficients, integer coefficients such that such that there exist there exist four distinct integers 
four distinct integers a1 a2 a3 and a4 with f of a1 is equal to f of a2 is equal to f of a3 is equal to f of a4 is equal to 1991 okay yeah show that show that there exists no integer b no integer b such that f of b is equal to 1993 <clears throat> again try to prove by contradiction okay hmm. assume that there is an integer b assume there is an integer b such that f of b is equal to 1993 and now think about what can you do about this right mm -hmm. there are four values four different integers a1 a2 a3 a4 whose values are same right f of x yeah have you ever seen a question like this before no i may mean, not exactly but Similar. something like running around this type like they're like a cup two polynomials which are the same as each other and like but usually in those questions they ask you to find a certain value, value. of another yeah, yeah, yeah. polynomial yes so it is like that only is just slight extended so you should think of a new polynomial here right hmm. g of x is equal to f of x minus 1991 construct a yeah. new polynomial g of x because then you will know that at a1 a2 a3 a4 your g will disappear right yeah so so you can say that a1 a2 a3 a4 are roots of g right yeah correct no because g of a1 is 0 g of a2 is 0 right yeah so that is the hint if you think of that and now try to figure out now you have already assumed that there is an integer f of b is 199 so try it for 5 minutes this is these are questions that have come in actual olympiad so 1991 this problem must have been in some olympiad in 1991 try it
<laughs> okay. Any luck? Mm. Only thing I could think of was maybe if we, but yeah, I see no what nothing either. I tried it, but don't know if you anything good. So a one, a two, a three, a four are roots. So what are the factors? X minus a one, x minus a two, x minus a three. Hmm. These are the Sorry. factors of gx, right? Yeah. So gx can be written as now x minus a1 multiplied by x minus a2 multiplied by x minus a3 multiplied by some other polynomial, right? Let's say hx, right? Hx, yes. We don't know the degree of g, therefore we have to write hx, right? Right. <coughs> okay. Now, but what we know for sure is that G, gx was a polynomial with integer coefficients, right? Because fx was integer coefficients. Yes. So therefore, hx also is integer coefficients, right? Yeah. Because gx is being factorized into that, and these are all fine. So this is also integer coefficients. So what is the value of g of b? If you take g of b, right, you get b minus a1 b minus a2 b minus a3 b minus a4 h of b right correct yes and yeah. that is equal to g of b is f of b minus 1991 yeah so that is 2 right mm -hmm. because f of b we have assumed is 1993 right yeah and b is some integer here right yes because we have assumed that there is an integer b such that Right? Yes, yes. Awesome. So now we have two is equal to this, right? Yeah. Correct. So yeah. uh, two has how many factors? Only two, it's prime. Uh, so uh, negative also is possible. Uh, negative one, negative two, so four factors. Correct. Four so, integer factors, yeah. Four integer factors, minus one, one, two, minus two, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So then how can you write it as a product of five integers, right? Maybe they can be repeated. Can't like be repeated because think about it. B minus A1 is different from B minus A2, different from this, different from this, because what was happening? Four distinct, right? Huh. Right. Yeah. So these four are definitely different, no? Yes. Correct. Does that mean that they, it, this can't exist, I guess? Huh, because then H of B, like you have these four must be four factors somehow. These four factors, right? Yeah. So then you will get a four here, no? Four times H of B, right? Yes. Is it, If any of the four factors are these four, right? Then you'll get four and you'll get this, which is not possible because H of B becomes a fraction. No? Yeah. You understand the problem is that. Huh, but are... why can't H of B be not become a fraction? Because H of B is supposed to be an integer polynomial, no? Oh, oh yeah, because um because GX is an integer polynomial, because FX uh, is an integer integer polynomial, and X mm. minus A1 and X minus A2 are all integers, integers only because X is integer. Correct. So five integers cannot be multiplied to become two, right? Right. You can only have four integers multiplied to become two. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So yeah. one of them has to become a fraction, which is not possible. Correct. Yeah. So that is a contradiction. So we have assumed that there was an integer b such that f of b was one nine nine three, and from there. But now this, getting, uh, now this contradiction. Yeah. So this is slightly harder than the problems that will come in your AMC ten. But AMC ten would have been a problem where you are you would be asked a value of f of ten or something. Right. You would be given some values. And we'll given with you'll be given this, and you find f of ten, another different number. So we'll see such questions soon. Right now, just write it down if you're not written the argument why it is coming. Yeah. Okay.
vision. You have written? Uh, almost. Hmm. No, this is not a choice. Okay. <clears throat> then we come. Okay. Uh, then we come to the fundamental theorem of algebra, which is something that was proved by Gauss. It says that every polynomial f of x of degree n has at least one complex root. Uh, complex numbers, you know, basics, like what is a complex number or not? No. Okay. Do you know what is a complex number? Um, yeah, it's a number that involves like at it has, it's a number that involves at least one sum of i, a plus i, b, yeah, that's it. Oh, so it's a number that has an, it is of the form a plus i, b, where a and b are real, and i is a symbol which i square is equal to minus one, okay? So yeah, okay. i can be written as root minus one, and the number can be written as a, like, Generally, numbers that you have, real numbers are all on one line, right? The real line, correct? Yes. Now, you have a two-dimensional plane. Like, all the real numbers could have been fit on a line. But all complex numbers, you will need two dimensions. You will put one up. So, this point A, comma B, just like it is Y and X axis, right? This point A, comma B will represent the complex number A plus BI. This is B height, okay? So this will be the complex number A plus B I. So basically any point in the 2D plane, right? Yeah. It'll have its own coordinates, right? Yes. So you can write it as a complex number. So if this is five comma two, you'll write it as five plus two I. If this is minus uh, two, four comma minus two, you'll write it as four minus two i. You understand? Yeah. So it's a two dimensional number sort of, like it's not just one number is not sufficient to describe a complex number. For a real number, you just needed root two, right? Nothing else you needed, right? It's a one, yeah. dim one dimensional numbers are real numbers, two dimensional numbers are complex numbers. They are even higher dimensional numbers than complex numbers. Sometimes we have oct octon octonians and basically eight dimensional numbers and all. Quaternions are four dimensional. So mm. we don't need to worry about them. But right now just realize that complex number is just another kind of number. Just like we have constructed real numbers. Similarly, there's complex numbers. It's It can be written as an ordered pair of two real numbers, A comma B. What, this is real, this is real. And this defines a point in the xy plane, right? And that yeah. number, that point will be written as a plus bi. So for now, you don't need to do anything other than know that normal rules of addition multiplication will, will be satisfied by complex numbers. Uh, you just have to do it as if you are doing algebra. Okay. Okay. So for example, if you are multiplying two expressions by algebra, what do you do? You do ac plus i into ad plus i into bc plus i square into bt, right? Yes. And then you will say that i square is minus one. So it will be ac minus pd plus i times ad plus bc, right? Yeah. So this is real, this is real, and this is your final product complex number. When you multiply this and this, right? Correct? Yeah. And when you add and all, it is obvious, like a plus bi plus c plus di. So you'll just do A plus C, the real parts, plus I, the complex part, B plus D, right? Yes. The final addition of these two complex numbers, right? So basic operations are very straightforward. It's the same thing. It's almost like doing algebra. Just put I square is equal to minus one whenever, right? 
Yeah. And suppose I have to divide, right? Division is slightly different. So not really, but you want to write it as a complex number eventually. Answer should be a complex number, right? So what I will do is this, see, I'm supposed to divide these two numbers, right? Correct. Okay. okay. I'm getting two complex numbers. I'm supposed to divide and get an answer as a complex number. So what I will do is I will multiply the top with a conjugate C minus ID and denominator also C minus ID, right? This doesn't change anything, right? Yes. But what this does, it makes the denominator a real number because it becomes C square minus I square D square, right? And I square is minus one that becomes C square plus D square, right? Correct? Yes. So denominator became a real number. Therefore, now I just do simple multiplication on top and I say AC uh, minus I square BD minus I square BD becomes plus BD. And then I write plus I into BC minus AD, right? Yes. And divided by C square plus D square. So now notice that you have one real part, AC plus BD by C square plus D square, and one imaginary part. This is the other part, right? This is also a real number, right? Yeah. So this can be your first part like A, and this is your second part like B. B the, both have to be real, right? So that is the answer of division. You don't need to remember the answer and all, you can just have to do it, right? So the basic operations on complex numbers are obvious and later we'll do them also properly. So don't worry about it. You just need to know that it is a two dimensional number and written as A plus B, right? Correct? Yes. So the fundamental theorem of algebra says that every polynomial fx of degree n has at least one complex root. Now, that's fine. That means that fx can be written as x minus some root alpha and some gx, right? And gx will have degree n minus one if this was degree n, right? Yes. Alpha can be complex, right? So alpha right. have been written as a plus bi or something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now uh, you have to realize that all real numbers can be written as complex numbers. All real numbers like one can be written as one plus zero i, right? Yeah. Minus two can be written as minus two plus zero i. So it's like this. The set of real numbers is like this real and the set of complex numbers is like this complex. All real <laughs> numbers are complex, but all complex numbers are not real right yeah so yes so what you have here by fundamental theorem is that any polynomial will always have at least one root which will be a complex number sometimes that root is a real number but all real numbers can be called complex right so you can say that alpha can be complex right yes now, from here what he did goss was and what other people also realized was that fx can be written like this. Therefore, now gx is a n minus one degree polynomial, right? Yes. So yeah. Now, applying fundamental theorem on gx, gx could be written also as, it will also have at least one complex root, right? So gx can be written yeah. like minus beta into hx, right? Um, yeah. Right. So similar, yeah. now this will be n minus two degree, no? Yeah. So similarly, like you can basically decompose your function and keep getting all the roots, right? Till you finally get a degree one polynomial here. Correct? Yeah. And basically yeah. people figured out from here that any n degree polynomial will therefore have at most n roots, right? Yes. Correct? We will break it yeah. down into n different linear factors Sometimes these numbers, the, the roots could be complex numbers. That is possible, right? So for yeah. example, if you take x square plus one, right? Is, he, is yeah. my polynomial. Now in yes. real numbers, there is no root, right? Yes. 
in real numbers there is no root here but we can always write it as x square plus i square was minus 1 right so minus i square is equal to 1 no correct yes so you can write it as x minus i and x plus i right yes so therefore i and minus i are two complex roots for this two complex roots basically i is a number which is 0 plus 1 into i and minus i is a number 0 plus minus 1 into i right yeah and these complex numbers will be put on the uh, xy plane like this it will be 0 plus 1 into i this is 0 comma 1 and this is 0 comma minus 1 right Correct. So these are the two points where you have roots for this polynomial. In real numbers, there is no root. There is no number on this axis which will satisfy it and make it zero, right? But in complex numbers, there is a root, right? Yes. Correct. So basically, Correct. any polynomial of n degree, you can always get n roots. Some of the roots may be real, some of the roots may be complex but that should not be like something that is weird. It's obvious, right? Right. Now, uh, we will look at, let's say we are looking at polynomials like this, a n x n plus a n minus one, x n minus one and so on, right? That's a one x plus a naught, right? Now, yes. here, suppose we have found roots are alpha one, alpha two, and so on till alpha n. These are the roots. Right? So we know that this polynomial can be factorized as x minus alpha one, x minus alpha two, and so on. Right? Um, yeah. But uh, so you have to be careful here because if the leading term is a n, then the multiplication here will only give you x power n. No? Yeah. So you should always write this. Right? Right. You should multiply a n out so that you get the first term here, right? Yeah. So basically the idea is a n should be taken out common first only. And once you take out common, you have a polynomial with leading term one and something like this, right? Yeah. And after that, factorize this polynomial and get its roots, right? Yeah. So any polynomial can always be written as some constant a, which is the first, which is the leading coefficient multiplied by its roots, factors of its roots, right? Correct? Yeah, yes, right. So this is very useful. Like in many problems, writing the polynomial like this helps you to solve it. So keep this in mind. The polynomial is written like this, but it can also be written as the product of its factors. And don't forget the first term A, right? Correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, then let's look at a real polynomial. Let's look at a polynomial like this, x squared plus x plus one, right? Yes. Real polynomial, what I mean is that all coefficients are real. Yeah. Correct. So now you realize that this polynomial doesn't have any real roots, doesn't have any real roots, right? Yeah. Now, if it doesn't have any real roots, then we know by fundamental theorem, it has to have two roots. Both the roots must be now complex, right? Correct? Yes. Because no real roots are there. So the, the roots can either be real or can be complex, right? So, if you try to find the roots of this equation by the quadratic formula, what will you get? You'll get minus one plus minus root over b square, which is one minus four by two into one, right? Correct? Yeah. You'll get minus one plus minus root over minus three, right? By two, right? Correct? Yes. So now the problem is that this is not defined for real numbers, but in complex numbers, this is not a problem because I can write it as plus minus root three into root minus one, right? By two, right? Yeah. And I is called root minus one. So this is becoming minus half plus minus one 
plus minus root three by two into i, right? Yes. So one root is minus half plus root three by two into i, and another root is minus half minus root three by two into i, right? Yes. These are the two roots. Correct. Yeah. Now, think about it. If you do some of the roots, right? Yeah. Some of the roots. This is my root. Do some of the roots. You will get what? See what is coming. Some of the roots is minus one, right? Yeah. Which is equal to minus b by a here. Right. Oh. Oh. Yes. So we had this result already when we did quadratic equations. We had Vieta's relations, right? Minus b by a, some of the roots and all. Right? Yes. So thing is coming again, right? So yes. Even if the roots are complex, Vieta's relations are still valid, right? Yes. And product of the roots, let's do product of the roots. Let's check once. So this will come out to be this is something a and this is plus b and this is a and minus b right so so product of the roots should be a square minus b square right which will be yeah. 1 by 4 minus root 3 by 2 i whole square right 1 by 4 minus 3 by 4 i square right yeah and i square is minus 1 so it is 1 by 4 plus 3 by 4 which is 1 which is equal to c by a Correct. Okay. So what I, what we are seeing is that the results that we had learned for quadratic equations that sum of the roots is minus b by a and product of the roots is this. They these are still valid even when the roots are non-real. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So now one important point here, uh, like if I have an equation like this, let's say x power four minus one is equal to zero, right? This equation. Now, it, the polynomial here is a fourth degree polynomial, right? Four degree, right? So number of complex, number of roots should be? Product of roots? Number of roots should be how many? Number of roots? Um, four? I mean less. I mean um less than. I mean no, less than four. or equal to four. No, it is always four. If if n is the degree, that is the number of roots. It's. I thought it was not necessarily always that way. It is always that way. Okay. Some of the roots are real. Some of the roots are complex. But total number of roots is four. Okay. Uh, okay. So if the total number of roots is four here. You can factorize it easily and you can say that x square minus one, x square plus one is equal to zero and x minus one, x plus one, and we can factorize this also x minus i, x plus i, right? Yes. The roots are coming one minus one, i minus i, right? Yeah. So uh, notice that some of the roots, if we had done Vieta's relation, some of the roots would have been minus first, second highest coefficient by highest coefficient, right? something like this, but second highest coefficient would have been x cubed that, that has zero coefficient. So it is zero, right? Yes. Notice that the sum of these four is also zero, right? Yes. So if I have a equation like this, let's say a x cubed plus b x squared plus c x plus d. And let's say that a, b, c, d are all real, right? Yes. a, b, c, d are all real then sum of the roots is a real number, right? Yeah. Sum of the roots is equal to minus b by a is a real number, correct? Yeah. And if the equation now has some complex roots, if this is, it is possible that this equation had some complex roots, like this equation had complex roots, right? Two of them, right? Okay. You understand what I'm saying? I'm saying it is possible that this equation has complex roots and real roots, right? A combination, right? Yeah. But sum of roots is still real, right? Yeah. So complex roots should be such 
that they cancel out and become real no when added should be such that when added they become real right yeah they become real you understand what i'm saying yes otherwise how will you add up all the roots and get a real number right correct yeah if minus b by a is real you cannot have root c plus di and e plus fi and say let's say some real number alpha you cannot have alpha plus c plus di plus e plus fi is equal to real if it is not satisfying some nice condition that the i part has to cancel right yeah correct yes so what we can say and similarly product of the roots is also going to be real product of roots here will be minus d by a that also has to be real right because d um, and yeah. a are real numbers right make sense so the product the multiplication of these two also should turn out to be real right are you understanding what i'm saying yes so for example let's take another example let's do a polynomial x square plus 3x plus 3 let's say mm. uh no not 3x plus 3 let's do 3x plus 1 this is my polynomial now uh you will realize no 3x plus 3 actually is better uh b square minus 4ac is negative right here correct yeah so therefore no real roots are there so this polynomial has only imaginary roots right yeah so yes. let's say if it has complex roots let's say one of them is a plus di and another one is c plus di right correct yeah so uh a plus b i and c plus d i will satisfy this equation and we have product of the roots a plus b i into c plus d i should be equal to 3 by 1 right yeah some of the roots a plus b i plus c plus d i sub plus c is equal to negative 3 is equal to negative 3 right the problem yeah. is that both of them are real right yeah so how will you have a situation where two complex numbers are multiplied and added and they both become real right it's when i is hmm. well i is already squared nonetheless i guess so let's add it let's add it here so this is going to be minus 3 right yeah this can be minus 3 only if b plus d is 0 because this is minus right. 3 plus 0i no yeah you cannot have this non zero and have minus 3 right yeah so this being non zero means it is complex mm -hmm. it is side is real right correct so this implies that b should be equal to minus d right um yeah and if we put that in this one let's see what happens here a plus bi and c minus bi right Yep. Instead of d, I have put minus b, right? So now let yes. us multiply it. A c and minus a b i plus b c i and minus b square i square is equal to three. So you get which is just equal to a c plus b square plus b square plus i a b minus b c, right? Yeah. Is equal to three. Again, AB minus BC should be zero, no? Yeah. So AB minus BC should be zero. So B. So AB is equal to BC. Ah, huh. so either B is zero or either B is zero or A is equal to C, right? Right. So B cannot be zero because then the roots will be real, right? Right. B cannot be zero, so you have to have A is equal to C, right? Yes. So the two conditions that are coming are A is equal to C, B is equal to minus B, right? So, so it becomes um c minus i mean it becomes c square minus b square 
this is what is coming these are the two roots no yeah yeah a a and b i write it like this a plus b i and the other roots a is equal to c so c becomes a and d becomes minus b right um yeah so the roots are of a nice form a plus b i a minus b i because then only when you add b i b i get cancelled right yeah so 2a is equal to negative 3 so a is equal to negative 3 by 2 uh, we don't have to find it i'm just telling you what no. is happening what is happening is if the complex roots are coming they are coming in a nice way that a plus b i and a minus b i right and they are and they'll always come in this way ha huh, that they will always come in this way if and only if all the coefficients are real right yeah that was happening only because this number was real and this number was real right yeah correct so yeah. the rule is that if you have any polynomial any polynomial like this and let's say all of those numbers a n a n minus 1 a 1 a 0 all of those numbers are real right yes then then by vieta's relations you have some of the roots will be real right some of the roots product of the roots some of the roots taken two at a time three at a time whatever right all of okay. those things will be ratios of this and this right it will be things like this right right yes okay so these are all real numbers right correct yes so even if this polynomial had some complex roots they will always fit this pattern if a plus bi is a root then a minus bi also must be a root correct yeah so complex roots will come in pairs so if a plus bi is a root then a minus bi is also root if another root was there c plus di then c minus di also has to be there so that when you do the sum they cancel right the complex parts will cancel correct yeah are you understanding yes this is very important and we can see some examples in different questions here uh for example the problem the thing that is happening here is if i have a polynomial equation like this where coefficients are real then what we had is imaginary roots or complex roots complex roots come in pairs right roots come in yes. pairs because the addition has to still be real right yes similarly if i have a polynomial where mm -hmm. coefficients mm -hmm. are rational mm -hmm. coefficients here are integers let's say are integers or rational numbers yes rational numbers then what if this equation has an irrational root right it is yes. possible that this equation will have an irrational root right you can yeah. find the root and you will realize that it is irrational minus 5 plus minus root over 25 minus 4 into 4 okay maybe i should put it as 2 or uh, 25 minus 4 into 2 into 2s okay this is bad because 2 should not have been there i will just put it as uh i'm just making up an example so let's put it as 1 right so uh minus 5 plus minus b square which is 25 minus 4 into 2 into 1 right by 2 yeah. to 2 so notice that this is 17 root 17 is coming right yes correct so what yeah. i'm saying is uh if if this is one one irrational root came minus 5 plus root 17 by 4 then there is another irrational root right correct yes why is this happening because some of the roots was what some of roots was minus 5 by 2 right and this is rational number no yes if one irrational root has come it has to have its conjugate irrational so that the irrational part can cancel and become rational right like um 
you add the roots, then only root 17 by 4 is cancelling minus root 17. Yeah. Right? Then only yeah. it is becoming rational, no? Yeah. If I had roots like, suppose I had one root like minus 5 plus root 17, another root was root 3. Then it was yeah. not, you know, to be irrational, no? Some. Yeah. Totally. So, so the idea is that if my coefficients are rational, then irrational roots come in pairs, right? Uh, yes. Similarly, if my coefficients are real, then complex roots come in pairs, right? Um, because yeah. it's the same logic. You understand? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that is quite important because we'll see many times questions which will use this fact. Uh, for example, let's do one question. This is let find the polynomial, find the polynomial of lowest degree, lowest degree with integer coefficients, with integer coefficients. such that such that root 5 is a root of the polynomial okay so try this Okay. Isn't it x squared minus five? I don't. I never mind.
You're getting something. Yes. Um. Mm. If x minus so root the the root always come in pairs. So x minus root five is one factor. So x plus root five would be another two. Mm. Is also a factor. Why will it come in pairs here? Because this line, this step. Integer right? co co coefficients, yeah. You could also have gotten rational. If it was written rational coefficients, also, you would say that irrational root will come in pairs, right? Right. right. Even if it was written rational, it would have still been true, this thing. Mm -hmm. But if it had irrational coefficients, then you cannot say that, right? Yes. Makes sense. So yep. the polynomial should be x minus root 5, x plus root 5. And you should multiply by a, right? We don't know about the first coefficient. Right. And you can make higher polynomials, but this is the lowest degree, right? Yeah. Two. A into x square minus 5. So our polynomial can be a, a x square minus 5a. This is the lowest possible polynomial here. Right. Right. Yep. Now, one more theorem which says that a polynomial f of x, a polynomial f of x of degree n, degree n is identically zero. It is always a zero polynomial, identical zero, if it vanishes, vanishes or becomes zero for at least n plus one distinct points, distinct values of x. So what does this mean? This means that you are saying that the polynomial fx has become zero for n plus one values of x, which are different, right? So then you are saying polynomial fx has n plus one different roots, right? Yes. But by fundamental theorem, a polynomial fx can have only, if it has degree n, can have only n roots, right? Yes. So then this will be a contradiction if it has n plus one different roots, right? Correct. If it yes. has degree n, it cannot have n plus one. So how is this happening? This can only happen if the polynomial itself is a zero, zero, right? Yes. This zero, identically zero polynomial, this polynomial has infinite roots. For any value of x, it is zero, right? Yeah. So this is very useful because sometimes what you will have is situations like this, if two polynomials, two polynomials, let's say fx and gx, mm -hmm. fx and gx have degree, same degree, have degree m, right? Right. No, degree is different, m and n. This is m, this is n. And okay. m is less than equal to n, right? And yes fx and gx have the same value have the same value at n plus 1 different points different x values right correct yes then the two polynomials must be equal cool why must be equal then you have you can show that fx is equal to actually gx why because these were two different polynomials of degree m and n where n was the higher number right so yes if fx and gx have the same value that means let's say f of a1 is equal to g of a1 and similarly f of a2 was g of a2 and so on, you had f of a n plus one was equal to g of a n plus one, right? Yes. Then you could construct a new polynomial hx, which is fx minus gx, right? Yeah. And this new polynomial has how many roots? 
n plus 1 roots because see at a1 it is 0 at a2 h of a1 h of a2 till h of a n plus 1 right it is all zero, zero. zero. Yeah. So it has n plus one roots, but we know that degree of hx has to be n, right? Maximum degree, right? Yeah. So how can a degree n polynomial have n plus one roots? That means hx is a zero polynomial, right? Yeah. So if hx is a zero polynomial, you know, need fx must be gx, right? Yes. Using the previous thing, if you have a zero polynomial, if you have a degree n and n plus one roots, then you are a zero polynomial, right? Correct. Yeah. So fx minus gx must be zero, so fx must be gx, right? Make sense? Yes. So if two polynomials have maximum degree n and they are having same value at n plus one points then their polynomials are equal right yes okay now i'll give you some questions you try them out and next class we'll discuss the solutions uh i'll just write down the questions uh let px px is a polynomial polynomial such that x into p of x minus 1 is equal to x minus 4 multiplied by p of x. For all x belongs to real, find all such px. This is the first question. Just write down the question. Question 2. Px is this for homework? Hmm. Is a monic. Monic means what? Um, one degree. No. Monic polynomial. Like one, 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 one. Um, no. One no. variable. No. I said this in the beginning of the class. Leading coefficient is one. Oh. Leading coefficient means what? Um. Like the first coefficient, the yeah, highest the power. Coefficient. Yeah, the um, coefficient of the highest power. Uh, if px is a monic cubic polynomial such that such that p of one is one, p of two is two, and p of three is three find p of 4. This is the kind of question you will see in your AMC. Okay. okay. Find p of 4. Okay. Oh yeah, this is definitely the kind of question I will say. Yeah. Then the next one is show that <laughs> x minus 1 whole square is a factor of x power n minus nx plus n minus 1. Question 4 is if a, b, c, d, e are all roots of roots of this polynomial 6x power 5 plus 5x power 4 plus 4x power 3 plus 3x square plus 2x plus 1. Find the value of, find the value of 1 plus a, 1 plus b, 1 plus c, 1 plus d, 1 plus e. Okay. Yes. I'm going to wrap the first two questions. You have written them, no? Yeah. Okay.
question five. Um. Question five is similar to the previous one. This time you have alpha, beta, gamma, delta are roots of roots of x power four plus p x cube plus q x square plus r x plus s is equal to zero. You have to find out find the value of one plus alpha square. 1 plus beta square, 1 plus gamma square, 1 plus delta square, similar to this one. Then the question is, if fx is equal to x power 4 plus ax cube plus bx square plus cx plus t, is a polynomial such that f of 1 is equal to 10, f of 2 is equal to 20, f of 3 is equal to 30. Find f of 12 plus f of minus 8 divided by 10. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's it for now, I think. Yeah, that's it. The six questions. Try these six and then we'll continue. Uh, yeah. We'll probably do one more class on polynomials. After that, we'll do coordinate. Okay. So next class will also be polynomials. Let's just do the do these six and come and then we'll discuss more. Okay. Yeah, one minute. So I'm just writing it down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I wrote all the questions down. Hmm. Try these and you can also try from AOPS, uh, your volume one or volume two books. You, there will be chapters on polynomials there also, I'm sure. So yeah, you can try questions from there also. Uh, we'll do one more class on this. Not much is left, but some equation solving techniques and all we have to discuss. Okay. Okay. That's all for now. I'll see you next week then. Next class.